What I think is exciting is as we get more and more monitors on these farms, it can start telling in real time when milk fat and when milk, milk protein and milk lactose is changing. We really can hone in on the mega cows of that milk protein, of that milk fat. And then hopefully, I mean, in the ideal scenario, we'll automatically, automatically be adjusting that cow's robotic feed to match what's going on in her milk or to enhance her production of whatever component is changing in milk. Good day and uh, welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show today. It's a pleasure uh, for me to have with us Dr. Elizabeth Lizzie French from the USDA, USDA uh, Dairy Forage Research Center. And uh, we just took some time here before the podcast to, to catch up. And uh, I haven't met Lizzie before, so it was great to uh, have an introduction and learn a bit about her background and, and her current research, which is really exciting. Um, so Lizzie, if you could give us a brief introduction of how you, uh, you have quite an interesting uh, past from, from growing up right down the road from the university uh, at Dairies. It sounds like you, you from how you described it, it sounds like you were maybe riding your bike and, and, and given those days, maybe just were able to pop in and, and pet the calves and, and uh, gain a love for cattle uh, all the way through to be working in, in D. Laval or commercially and, and, and now USDA. So if you can give uh, the listeners a little bit of a background. Yeah, thank you. Uh, born and raised in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, and yeah, grew up right down from the South Farms Research Center of uh, from there, I really gained a passion and love for dairy nutrition and really tried to see how far I could take it. And it turns out you can go to a lot of schooling in uh, dairy nutrition. And so I was really fortunate to complete my undergrad at Illinois and then move up to Madison, Wisconsin for both my master's and PhD. And from there, just wanted to see where I could continue going in this field of dairy and kind of switched gears to research um, after I was finished with uh, graduate school and worked at D. Laval in clinical trials uh, and then getting really into the robotic and automatic milking system area. And from there, working with producers directly and managing their data and helping them fine tune their systems to optimize, I really wanted to take the next step in getting into feeding herds and working directly uh, with uh, dairy producers as well as a nutritionist on farm. And so that led me to Purina Animal Nutrition, where I had the opportunity uh, to work with their strategic uh, sales side and then eventually in the technical side, working not only with my own herds, but also the various field nutritionists and cooperatives within the Purina network and supporting their customers, well, both with automatic as well as conventional uh, uh, milking systems. And then the opportunity presented itself to take this role as research animal scientist at USDA. And it really feels like the culmination of my career and putting together uh, the basic nutritional background from graduate school to data management, working with uh, robotic customers to feeding uh, customers, uh, or to be feeding customers herds and working with uh, the robotic facilities. And now uh, my research program focuses on precision animal nutrition, uh, whether or not it's through ag collecting aggregate data and trying to make predictive models for uh, improving animal nutrition and feed efficiency, as well as looking at ways to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a little bit of background about myself and uh, yeah, how I ended up here at USDA. Great, great. And then that path, uh, obviously lots of experience uh, from from feeding cows to research and, and now bringing that all together with, with USDA. Um, so really interested to, as we chatted there before, a bit about the precision feeding, uh, you know, certainly a wide range of herbs that we, we work with. Um, day to day and the ability to, to precision feed. Can you give a little bit of background of the project you're working on? And then what I think is really neat is it's not just feeding, but then that link between uh, precision milking, really. So precision feeding, precision milking. And then I think as you, you know, wrap all these things together with, with lots of sensor data and, <clears throat> and so forth that, that many farms are adapting, um, we don't really, where does the future hold for being able to really precision manage dairy cattle? Well, when you think about the automatic milking, automatic milking systems as a whole, we really have the opportunity to optimize the milking frequency of those animals, the nutrition, 
Because as we go along managing the stages of lactation, we're trying to optimize and reach achieve a certain amount of milkings per day based on where that animal's at in days in milk and given her reproductive status, her nutritional status, et cetera. And so it's been really interesting to see, uh, for instance, in early lactation, we're starting to discover how milking certain parodies of cows have more benefit than, say, other parodies of cows to set that cow up for the greatest amount of milk production and milk produ production efficiency. So that's one way where adjusting the milking permissions themselves, we can really impact how frequently does that cow get to visit the robot. But then as we're thinking about that, every time she has the chance to visit the robot, she also has the opportunity for to feed or to consume a uh, robotic feed of some kind. And from that standpoint, no matter what sort of um, guided system, you, if you have guided or a free flow system, the feed can range in 4 to 25% of that animal's total megacals of um, feed per day. And so we really have the opportunity to fine tune those animals. So going back to some of the research that we're starting to discover, we're really seeing that if we can maximize milking frequency early in lactation for some of these third and greater parity cows, we actually might be even starting to prime their rumen and their uh, digestive system to be able to be more effective in um, handling nutrients and producing milk overall. So, Lucy, that that's so cool. I know I've, I've said this a few times on the on different podcasts is, you know, when I started my career uh, in northern New York, working in general with farms that were managed by uh, owners and, and in general, smaller herds, there was lots of individual management of cows. So, you know, we're not going to breed this cow yet. And, 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 you know, this cow and perhaps in a tie stall gets fed this much. And, you know, and then as, as lots of herds expanded and we started implementing different herd management programs, we, we really pushed, okay, herd management. We can't individually manage a cow for a reproductive program. Uh, you know, even her individual feeding in most cases. And now what's so cool is that, you know, with 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 the data we have available and then and really sensor technology, we're we're going back to that individual cow management. How do we yeah, how do we manage that individual for her own production levels and reproduction and so forth. So um it's great to see that kind of full circle in the in the industry. And uh you know, many of our herds are adapting uh uh, to uh, forex milking in, in, in fresh cows uh, in early lactation. We do have some herds that milk forex through the entire lactation. Can you comment a little more specifically uh, what you're seeing in terms of you know, the frequency to days in milk and then, and then parity there? Because that, that's really exciting. Well, and you know, we have some exciting research that uh, I had the opportunity to work with my collaborators at uh, UT. W or University of Wisconsin Platteville and Dr. Ryan Prawley uh, and his lab in looking at milking frequency for the first 30 days in milk. So in this case, looking at uh, three time a day milking versus six time a day milking in our second and third uh, parity animals. And then the look again after that time at their production after the fact. Um, I will speak to the early lactation part because that's really the data that I focused on um, in the, that study. So I want to share that piece of it. But what we found was uh, looking at rumen fermentation uh, parameters of those animals. So we took collected um, rumen samples from those animals, uh, milk samples. And what we found when comparing the animals that were milked 3x versus 6x, uh, we noticed that we had reduced amounts of butyrate in those animals' rumen. And we're now in the process of analyzing the milk samples to see maybe where did that, that butyrate go? Was it incorporated more into milk fatty acids or was it used more through that animal's, uh, you know, other energetic, uh, you know, other energetic pathways? And what was interesting as well is just looking at some of the blood metabolites in those animals that gave us indication of how they may be partitioning uh, energy. But what we found was that those third lactation and greater animals uh, appear to have a greater carryover of production compared to um, the say second and uh, second lactation animals. So 
that again, three versus six, that's a very drastic range. And we weren't even quite able to achieve an average of six X milking and ended up being a 4.9. So when we're thinking about that, you know, and that total amount of time we have available on a herd, which animals does it make sense to try to get that extra fetch in per day? Or which animals are we, is it okay to have four X milking or three and a half milkings on average? And I think that that's always still something, and I'm segueing into, you know, as we're talking about these averages and milkings and within an animal's days in milk, it's not enough just to look at the average. We also really need to be talking about the variation within that average, too, and seeing that standard deviation, I think, too. So, again, while I'm seeing that we definitely can see improvements in this, I think within, you know, as folks go back and look at their own herd data, uh, even if you're hitting, say, that 4x milking at 30 days in milk for those third and uh, greater lactation cows, what also is the range? Are there some animals that are falling down to 2x milking? Are, are we really hitting, you know, everyone getting close to that target? And that's really interesting. Um, we have done some trials looking at 3 versus 4x milking uh, with some of our herds. And one of the questions that always comes up, of course, is is body condition and then future reproductive performance. We haven't seen any detriment, and we have plenty of herds that uh, are using you know the that management. Um, any comments there? Did you look at reproductive performance uh, also? Uh, they so um, collaborator um, Dr. Ray and Prolly and uh, collaborators are currently in the process of analyzing. Uh, some of that data, but from early investigation, I guess, so I can't totally speak on that, but I can see that that is being investigated. Uh, looking at blood metabolites, what I thought was interesting is we did notice that it, it appeared that there would be greater non-esterified fatty acids in those um, six-time milk cows or 4.9-time milk cows, where we did not see that elevation in the lower milk milking frequency animals. So again, as we talk about differences in time management, we also noticed that those animals milked six times a day or in that group, I keep saying that they actually had lower eating time. So it appears they were also maybe compensating that they weren't getting as much time at the bunk because they were being milked so frequently, if that makes sense. And so yes. again, we have to also see that breaking point, right? Where, where are we starting to now, we're seeing some long-term effects of production benefits for these third and greater parity cows. Uh, but again, early in lactation, we also can tell that we maybe limited some of our dry matter intake. So where's that sweet spot where maybe we could have even done better production at, you know, in between there, that three and six X, I guess. <laughs> and, and then the 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 individual farm variability there on um, stocking density, bulk space, and so forth, right? Yeah, oh, fine absolutely. Tuning, yeah, fine tuning it to to the to the farm, right? Well, and then you also have to think, because now as we get into some of these larger automatic milking system, you know, product farms, we also now grouping later like later days of milk animals. We have just fresh pens. We have our mid lactation cows. So now if you're stocking robotic pens based on within a given days of milk, that's also going to change how you're monitoring that data performance. The animals are going to be able to get through and be milked a number, you know, X number of times a day. Um, and then also just some of our performance monitors. So really... We have two different area or two different, you know, schools of thought where we're having those quote unquote homogeneous pens that are averaging 150 to 180 days in milk versus now we're grouping animals within lactation stage. So that also is going to change how we're looking at performance monitors and setting up those optimization and milk milking permissions. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, so can you comment further <clears throat> than the last game? Two, two uh, follow-ups to that. One is how does the precision feeding, or, or you know, on a on a large um, scale, what what are you looking at in terms of the nutrient profile changes as that cow moves through lactation, and, and pairing that with with milking frequency? So if you get and, and you know, and that first lactation interval compared to second and greater, what what are your sort of your early findings there in terms of the the opportunities? As we look across, I, I I still I know that as we look at some of the automatic milking systems, there's a lot of looking at just a single feed through the robot. As we look at how those animals partition nutrients and their requirement, I mean, of course, we, number one is making sure we take care of that rumen. So no matter what our forages, you know, I, you know, I, I focus a lot on what's going on with the robot, but we cannot 
forget that forages are king when it comes to ruminant nutrition. And so that has to be right. And trying to maximize forage intake should always be key. But within that, we know that early lactation, those animals have a greater protein requirement, a greater requirement for fermentable carbohydrates to drive glucose production, drive, drive milk production. Uh, and we also know that they have the opportunity to consume more fat, again, from the side of, uh, you know, increasing our caloric density. Well, you know, that only carries that animal so far until she hits her peak milk. Understanding that uh, multiparous animals are peaking in early days in milk compared to our first lactation animals. So if we think of milking permissions, for instance, we may say allow a greater milking frequency for our multiparous cows until say 90 days in milk versus 100 days in milk for our primiparous cows. And so within that, we're you know, hoping to achieve a certain frequency of milking. So let's say at least three and a half or say four milkings until we hit our peak milk. Uh, and so now we know that we have four opportunities for that animal to consume a feed stuff. And as I mentioned, depending on the type of um, cow traffic, that can be four to 25% of that animal's daily mega cows requirement. And so we have a lot of wiggle room within there. And I think there's a lot of, you know, opportunity to look at, you know, do we have that highly fermentable carbohydrate feed going through the robot that we're focusing, say, maybe on starch or soluble fibers, or we have more of our protein our high protein base feed that's focusing more, say, in my mind, on undegradable protein that is tends to be our most expensive feed that we're trying to promote to our post or excuse me, our pre-peak cows, our post-peak cows, or like our high producing cows. And so on that side, there really is an opportunity to when those animals visit the robot. I mean, t- if you look at the, you know, amount of dry matter intake that those feeds require per day. If they are visiting the robots four times, having, say, you know, even six minute milking time, that's ample opportunity to consume that feed stuff and not, say, feed those the undegradable protein source to those late lactation cows, which maybe don't need as great of a, you know, protein amount or necessarily they can rely on their microbial protein to carry them through, where, again, we can kind of cater those nutrition, those specific feeds to animals. And what I think is exciting is as we get more and more monitors on these farms, they can start telling in real time when milk fat and when milk, milk protein and milk lactose is changing. We really can hone in on the mega cows of that milk protein, of that milk fat. And then hopefully, I mean, in the ideal scenario, we'll automatically, automatically be adjusting that cow's robotic feed to match what's going on in her milk or to enhance her production of whatever component is changing in milk. Or if we see that, say, she's not hitting her milk fat target, can we adjust feed to promote more of that milk fat production? That's really interesting. And and I, I can't help but think back, you know, again, or early years of, of practice, the, the herringbone wage jar parlors that had the, the, the grain feeding within the parlor. Um, I know uh, locally here in in, in uh, Mexico, Madero Systems has uh, uh, worked on a, a system in a rotary parlor. I think it's up to four different supplements that could be fed in a in a modern rotary as that cow comes in based on her ID, and it could be you know one of one of four different supplements or a combination. Any thoughts? You know, you're, you're focusing on robotics for obvious reasons because that's the individual cow management from a feeding standpoint, but, you know, do, do, do you see uh, feed in the parlor coming back into vogue as the ability to really fine tune that individual cow's ration uh, becomes more more available? I'd say absolutely. I mean, if we look at the, you know, total, if the, con- the proportion that feed costs represent of our total, you know, cost of dairy production, if we have the opportunity to remove, you know, not necessarily give all cows the opportunity that don't need those higher cost feeds and can really cater while she's in the parlor, because we know we're going to have her for a set time of, you know, two to four times a day, depending on our management, that I think that it is a real opportunity uh, that way. And so I would say, yes, I, I, I hope that there is more of a move for that. I think that, again, having the right feeding systems so we're not overcomplicating things and eventually moving to something where we can automatically move beyond just adjusting feed based on milk volume or milk weight and really honing in on specific nutrients 
you know, whether or not that's nutrients and the partial mixed ration or the total mixed ration in this case, but obviously we're talking about feeding in the parlor, then that would still kind of be changing that feeds to more of a partial mixed ration. I guess that I really foresee that down the future that we could be, there's no reason why we wouldn't have four different supplements. And again, vitamins, minerals, I was focusing on some of the major, you know, different uh, nutrients uh, or chemical composition and feedstuffs. But yeah, you know, looking at say, different minerals and vitamins and that are better for animals in early lactation versus late lactation. Again, another opportunity, if you say don't have the chance to group animals in your early lactation, high producing group versus low, this is another way to fine tune that. Yeah. And you certainly, not only from the economic standpoint, which obviously has to drive, you know, any, any, uh, adoption of a new system or technology, but then you mentioned greenhouse gases and sustainability, I think that, you know, then really hits home to the, to the general public of, uh, you know, fine tuning, uh, nitrogen balance and so forth, you know, does that cow need to consume additional protein or other, other nutrients? So that, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and then within the, the, uh, you talked about milking frequency, what other milking system parameters um, are you looking at, if at all, in terms of, you know, uh, letdown by modality or, you know, how much simulation that cow needs, how much time she needs to milk? Are you, are you, are you looking at that area also as you're fine tuning this, this precision feeding milking? Absolutely. And we're in the early process of a project where we're, it, it incorporates some of the measurements that you just mentioned. But really, we're trying to grasp on how some of the data that you know producers are already getting from their systems, again, the individual quarter milk flow, um, attachment time, you know, total milking time that you're mentioning, the bimodality, uh, also you know, time in between milking, eating time, rumination time, and just activity time. And then, of course, what they're actually consuming at the robot, but then trying to put all that together and say, you know, what does this data tell us in real time about what, for, and my focus being nutrition, what's going on, say, at the feed bunk? And we've been starting to test when feed or specifically forage digestibility composition changes are taking place, or also not only digestibility um, or fiber digestibility, but additionally looking at uh, protein amount and going back to your point of you know nitrogen balance. So how can we use the data coming off of the robots to have estimates of what those nutrient compositions of forages are, given that those tend to be the or are the greatest um, you know component of the cow's diet. Uh, and we are finding that we're going to, we are starting to have their we believe we have the potential to estimate changes on these of the chemical composition. Uh, and we're in the early works of creating machine algorithms that incorporate this um, commercial AMS cow behavior milking data uh, from, you know, multiple AMS systems uh, to see how we could start to, again, automate this process of actually predicting our nutrient composition of forages from or automatic milking systems. And there'd be no reason eventually down the road if, you know, with some of the monitoring systems on commercial or to conventional farms, parlor systems to be able to do the same sort of um, estimates. Okay. Well, that's a great point. I this obviously varied uh, listeners on the podcast. So what would be some of the comments you'd make for those folks who, who don't have uh, robotic milking systems in terms of the, the ability, you know, as, as you look to apply some of this this information this research to a conventional farm what would be some of your comments there i think it harkens back to some like, the work that's been done where if we're able to group animals based on their physiological stage so again we have that early lactation pen or post fresh pen moving to high pr you know production pen if we have the again facilities that we can cater to and of course the feeding equipment that we can you know a cater to that feeding system. I think, of course, that is optimal. Um, I know there, of course, we are dealing with pen moves and we have to think of the impact of th that uh, on the animal. But really, when we're talking about, you know, optimizing our feed efficiency and precision nutrition, it comes back to, okay, can we set up our, you know, pens and management so we can say feed to those animals stage of lactation? And obviously, can you know, conventional farms are already 
doing that and, you know, adding different supplement packages. So, uh, you know, it's doing more of the same of, you know, having the right team in place that, of course, even if you are, if you are feeding a one group TMR that you're making sure your, um, you know, body condition score is, you know, adequate, bad, the, you know, beginning and end of lactation that we are getting animals bred on time and, you know, it's using the data that's already existing. So, uh, and even still, p- people are using rumination right now on um, conventional farms and seeing some of those differences in animal health and reproduction it tends to be. But I'd say that there's still going to be a potential to continue to use those sensors to look at overall nutrient composition. Um, again, we're focusing on forages right now, but I think the in the future, you know, incorporating more of the, you know, total mixed ration and not just, you know, the forages piece. But you have to have to search somewhere to make it simplified. Uh. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, Lizzie, ch- uh, changing gears a little bit, um, you met, you said forage is king, and I think you know anyone in the dairy industry, hopefully, uh, nutritionists, veterinarians, dairy producers themselves realize that, right? It, it, making milk comes with with great quality forages. Within USDA, what anything you can report exciting new technology or you know what. Uh, as we improve forage quality, digestibility, and so forth, and um, what, what, what's what's for the future? Well, there is an exciting focus on uh, cover crop rotations, and I know that there is tends to be that focus on um, you know sorghum, Sudan grass, uh, uh, looking at some of the those, but you know there's a variety, wide variety of cover crops that can be incorporated. That when we're talking about sustainability and say improving carbon sequestration, that that we see the evidence that they improve the soil health. But now we're taking a step further and saying, okay, okay, what can this actually do for the animal health incorporated into their diet? Uh, so that ends up being you know a range of cover crops. You know, looking more at monocultures to start, but down the road, looking at you know how can we have different forage mixtures as well, you know, and even going to back to alfalfa and grass mixtures, because if we're talking about some of the, I mean, forage digest, the fiber digestibility factors, um, having these mixtures of legumes and grasses, and then, you know, of course, corn silage, but that that's one of those ones you can debate. It's, you know, 50% forage is 50% concentrate, you know, it kind of fits into the both of those. And, uh, so that's really what we're, I'd say the USDA is continuing to focus on is, again, the exciting part within uh, the Dairy Forge Research Center is we have scientists in, you know, soil health and the agronomy side. We're working in the dairy nutrition side and trying to, again, put together what they're seeing works for the system they're, mon- they're measuring, but then taking that piece full cir- circle to the, you know, for my side, the animal feeding side, and how can we improve um, animal health, forage uh, use, and increase our forage feeding on these dairy systems. Uh, and so beyond that, I would say the going into some of the other special additives, whether or not that's biochar as a feed additive, you know, incorporating seaweed into diets and looking at reducing, uh, reducing methane emissions. Uh, there's a whole range of areas we're getting into uh, or continuing to, I guess, uh, research within USDA. Great, great. Well, that's, uh, I think, you know, the ability to, you know, n- not only promote soil health and, and, and erosion or other, other, uh, agronomy needs, but then actually have a useful crop to, to feed, um, for all classes of animals. Uh, that's certainly an important area. And, and, you know, Within our day-to-day work of, of working in different areas uh, where there's lots of byproducts and some rations that are fairly low in forage, given the geographic regions uh, where we are located, uh, those technologies are going to be critical to being able to feed more forage, uh, reduce feeding costs overall, and, and a healthier rumen also. That's that's the key. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting on the side of you know methane mitigation, you know we're really um, focusing a lot on we're looking at these adult animals, but we're also, you know, my research programs and others, we're starting to see evidence that, you know, some of this mitigation begins before the animal's even born. And so, again, what can we do either in that dam's, you know, or that, you know, that cow's uh, feed when she is, you know, pregnant into, the, you know, her dry period 
And what can we do for that calf early on as well? So there's just so many areas to explore in this. Uh, and it's just really exciting to see where, where the research is going to take us. So then are you, are, are you actually investigating potentially the change in the microbiome of the unborn, the rumen of the unborn calf or, or a future rumen of the unborn calf and how that affects its then development and, and, and lifetime methane production? Yes, yes. And so that's another exciting area of uh, there was an opportunity where we were looking at different um, in, or energy status of uh, late lactation diets. And so uh, looking in the last 70 days of lactation, feeding a higher low energy diet, what is the outcome of uh, those calves, I guess, health as well as like methane production long term? And so we're, that's one example. But we're also looking into, again, do additives play a role in the dam's diet late lactation that could have impact on that calf's, you know, productive outcome, uh, lifetime productive outcome, or are there things that we can include in, you know, milk early on in life. So no, that's a really cool area. I mean, you know, we 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 know well the, the benefits of, of early nutrition colostrum. And then there's, you know, some more recent data looking at heat stress and in, in dry cows and the effect on those cows. But I, I guess honestly, I mean, you know, from a macro standpoint, okay, nutrition of the cow affecting that calves, if you will, you know, productivity, vigor, and so forth. But to actually now think that you could potentially uh, change uh, the, 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 the rumen, you know, flora, if you will, to, to affect some out outcome in the future, that, that's, that's super exciting uh, information. Then, yeah, it, it really is. And a lot of this work has already been done in beef animals. So that's the other thing is that we know that this plays a role that, you know, that dam's diet on obviously that calf's productive you know life. And so going in a little bit deeper there and then in the backdrop of precision nutrition, of, you know, at each stage of that animal's life, what we're choosing to provide to that animal, what that means as an adult ruminant. Uh, and then if we can manipulate it on top of that, going full circle back to, you know, we can control her milking frequency and those individual macronutrients to give that animal, you know, where she is at in life based on her historical experience beginning in utero. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can impact that. And it's great to hear you mention calf nutrition. And, and I think, you know, most uh, groups working in nutrition uh, and so forth are really more focusing on the on the calf ration. I just said yesterday to my colleagues, you know, years ago that the, the calf ration came in a bag, right? You know, you open the bag of milk replacer or, or, or whole milk, but, you know, it was a scoop and so much water. And, you know, now how we've evolved to balancing rations for calves, but, you know, those opportunities and, and Again, that's a great point of how then that prepares that, that calf as we know, but also from the, the methane production side is, is an interesting aspect and is just making that animal more efficient then. Uh, you know, I think what a lot of, I hear some producers who aren't as excited about uh, the methane reduction piece, but you know, if that makes the rumen more efficient and therefore more energy, more nutrients available for, for milk or growth, well then that's the the win win, obviously. And that's some of the most efficient time that the animal is growing, right? And looking at her development. And also if we can start mitigating at that point in an animal's life, her dry matter consumption is much smaller than now. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of focus of understandably on adult mitigation, or you know, remittent mitigation, but that population's already been established. It it's really hard to manipulate it at that point. I mean, maybe short term, but that's where it comes into some of these additives. Will they be cost effective? Uh, and so any, there, there's a real exciting opportunity and I think a lot more to be learned on how we can, again, impact that early in life where it's going to be more cost effective for the producer and, again, more effective for that animal's productive life overall. Yeah. Well, those are some, some exciting areas. Um, so Lizzie, it's been great to, uh, to visit with you here uh, and, and, and learn more about what you're doing and then USDA Research Center specifically. And uh, I think the, you know, the future for these technologies to allow for individual cow management are, are really exciting. And uh, you know, some things that can be done today, uh, applicable to, to implement, you know, now you're working with some commercial dairies and then really what's, what's to the future. So 
um, great to, to get that update. And it sounds like we'll have to schedule another <clears throat> podcast in, in, in the future to, to, get, to get these updates on, on your work. Well, I look forward to it. No, uh, thank you for the opportunity to chat today. It's been okay. really enjoyable. Yeah. So a few wrap up questions that uh, we've been asking at the end of these uh, <clears throat> these podcasts is, is one for the for the listeners here. Uh, what's a reference uh, for for the dairy industry? So that could be you know a, a website, a, a textbook, a, a, a late lady press. Uh, what's something that you enjoy getting information from that you would like to share with the listeners? Oh gosh, I guess I still go back to a lot of my, I'm actually just looking up at my book right now, my nutritional ecology of the ruminant. And that's my Peter J. Van Seust book that I always think that that is kind of the foundation. I mean, again, it's not, not textbook for everyone, but for me, that's kind of the foundation when I'm just trying to think, uh, you know, putting the pieces of rumen microbiology together and taking it to that next, you know, how it's all interconnected with making milk. It just, you know, I guess keeps you humbled sometimes to think about how it's all interconnected and it's going to keep us busy for the, you know, for my lifetime. And I think, you know, the future's lifetime as well. <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, I had the fortunate opportunity to be an undergrad there uh, when Pete Van Seuss was still actively out uh, teaching and, and, and guiding students. So certainly a, a uh, an icon in, in, uh, ruminant uh, ecosystems and, and, and forages and, and certainly missed in the, in the industry. Um, for, for the more, I guess, uh, when you're not working or thinking about the room and any, any recent good reads, or as some folks said, you know, the, the march of documentaries or other, uh, movies or so and anything for when you're going to disconnect on the weekend. Oh, actually, if I tend to disconnect on the weekend, I'm either playing banjo, playing my saxophone, or when we have snow, which I guess thankfully it's almost gone now, I go dog sledding a lot. So that's actually how I like to check out quite a bit. Uh, and otherwise, uh, you know, reading, uh, I there I read some different poems by Young Pueblo, who uh, tends to focus on clarity and connection and some of those things just to, again, keep me grounded that way. <laughs> So you were a mushet. Yes, yes. <laughs> I only have two dogs right now. So down the road, eventually when I retire, I'll have many more dogs. But it's it's a wonderful hobby to enjoy on the weekends and actually just in the mornings when it snows. <laughs> um, no, I, I recently had the opportunity while uh, connecting with uh, vet school uh, friends in Breckenridge. Uh, we took one day from skiing and, and, and had a really great experience. These, these dogs, not to digress, but that were trained to follow a uh, a snowmobile so each, we each got to to drive which was super exciting it's 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 a lot of fun so oh that's great oh yeah. gosh i can't oh that'd be wonderful <laughs> and I, I thought it was going to be a touristy kind of uh you know type thing and it was it was actually lots of fun um and and then i guess as we part here um some some words to the industry you know if, if there's uh, uh you already said forage is king so You'll have to pick something different, you know, great forage quality. But yeah, wait for the dairy producers and consultants out there. You know, what's what's Lizzie's word of advice for the day? Well, I think that it's always good to keep in mind that people. I just like to benchmark against others in the industry, but what it comes back down to is what are your goals to make your business and your operation successful. So as you're working with your consultants, you're working with your advisors, everyone, your team, you know, really making sure that as you're evaluating your data, make sure that it's pertaining to what your goals are for your operation. It's great to have comparisons, but at the end of the day, are you making improvements for what's best for you and your future uh, and your herd as a whole? Thank you so much. And we could probably uh, take a pause and start another podcast on that, but uh, so many times just last week I heard, well, this herd is doing this and they have this conception rate. And, you know, it's like, oh, um, like, you know, it's a, it's t totally different. They have different breed and they have different management and it's just so different that we, that's great to know that you could achieve that fertility with that type of system, but it's not relevant to you. And don't change your reprocessing program because they're doing that successfully. So, so thanks. And we can, we can talk about that again all day, but internal benchmarking is great. 
external benchmarking is fun, right? Or interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I, uh, again, we, we could, we could restart the podcast. So, um, <laughs> Hey, it was a pleasure, Lizzie, to, to get to know you today and uh, look forward to uh, some, some future uh, conversations also during research opportunities and such. And uh, hopefully our uh, listeners will, will glean some uh, exciting information from the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.